Okay, welcome to the next GPU computing talk. This one is on a couple of, of examples. Um, a basic k-means example and a Markov chain Monte Carlo. And those are the two things on the agenda for today. Hang on, I'm having trouble with uh, my pointer again. Oh well, I don't need it. So there's, these are the two examples on the agenda for today, and that's it. So last time we talked about beginning programming in CUDA C, and I'm going to dive right into some practical examples that use CUDA C. So I'm going to review the algorithms behind these two things and how to implement them. So let's start with Lloyd's k-means. This is the most basic, most intuitive version of k-means, and k-means is just a problem whereby you cluster n vectors in Euclidean space or n points into some number of capital K groups. And here's a picture just showing points in your data set clustered into different groups. You might want to have some automatic procedure to figure out what grouping you should apply to your data set. And this is an algorithm that does that. Um, the steps are as follows. So you might start off with something like this. This is a simple, really simple data set. Um, I know this is a review from last time, from two talks ago, by the way, where we talked about just straight up algorithms with no code. I'm reviewing the algorithm before we go back to the code, though, because I'm going to refer back to this. Anyway, so the first step is, well, first of all, you have these gray boxes. Those are your data points. You don't know how they're clustered yet. That's what you want to try to figure out. And let's say I wanted to subdivide these into three clusters. We choose some collection of initial cluster centers. Now, choosing the cluster centers is non-trivial, but I'm going to dart around that problem for now and just say that, well, I'm going to choose these cluster centers, red, blue, and green, and these are these uh, red, blue, and green circles. We're, we're supposing that these are some you know, centers of the clusters of points that we have. And we're going to iteratively move the cluster centers, and regroup, regroup the points. First, we're going to assign in step two, step one was choosing the initial values, step two is assigning each data point to its closest center. So we take each square and find the circle that it's closest to. So this square is closest to the red circle, so it's in the red group. All these circles, uh, these, um, all these boxes here, these green boxes, are turned green because they're closest to the green circle, so they're going to be in the green cluster. And same thing for the blue clusters. So we have a clustering initially, but we're not done because we want to end up in a way such that these circles are the means of all of these data points. So we're going to recompute the cluster means. We're going to take the red circle to be the mean of the red points, the green circle to be the mean of the green points, and the blue circle to be the mean of the blue points. And that's how we re recompute our cluster centers. But we're still not done, because when we recompute our cluster centers here, we're going to have some points that are closer to a center of a different cluster than the current cluster. So these top two green points get assigned, well, at least this top green point gets assigned to this red group because it's now closer to the red cluster center than the green cluster center. So we, we recompute, we reassign each point to a corresponding group based on its minimum distance, its new minimum set of distances from the cluster centers. So we're going to end up with something like this because these, these two points shifted to the red group because were, they were closer to the red cluster center. Same with the greens and the blues. And we iterate this process. We recompute the cluster centers, and we regroup them. We recompute the distances, and so on. We just keep cycling this until convergence. And that could mean that there is, you know, by convergence, I usually mean that there is no change in clustering, um, ideally. Or that there is not much change in some objective function that you use, such as uh, mean squared error, the sum of squares of distances from the cluster centers. That's what you're really minimizing here. Um, and once that doesn't change very much, we know we've converged. So here's how you parallelize it. Remember, we're going we're gonna to start with 
step two first, which is assigning points to the closest cluster centers. We're going to do this in parallel. So we're going to take capital N blocks and K threads per block. And so remember, capital N is the number of data points. Capital K is the number of clusters that we think there are. And let thread NK, so data point N block, uh, K, data point N cluster K, that, that sort of pairing, possible pairing, has a corresponding thread. And we let thread NK compute the distance between data point N and cluster K. And so we have all these distances. And then we somehow synchronize threads within each block. We could, um, in the implementation that, that I coded up last year, I don't call sync threads explicitly. I just stop this kernel and then spawn another kernel instead of, instead of synchronizing threads. But you could implement it such that you sync threads here. Um, and by the way, it becomes really important at this stage that I have one block per data point. Because for each data point, you're computing all the distances between the cluster centers. And then once you have those distances, you want to assign that point specifically to the minimum distance to the, to the nearest cluster center. So you really need, for each point, you really need only all the distances between that point and the corresponding cluster centers before you synchronize. I don't care about the other points. But for each individual point, I need to compute things for all the cluster centers before I sync and then and then synchronize in order to move on. So that's sort of why I group I grouped up um, I assign one block per data point instead of one block per cluster. Because I know that I can consider in this step, I can consider data points independently, and I can do their calculations in parallel. Um, but the same thing is not true for clusters. Does that make sense? Yes. That's a really good question. So hmm. then I would need to give each thread, I would need to give each, each data point multiple blocks. And I would use, so hmm. yeah, that's a good question. It's, right, 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 that big. 100,000 data points. So you could, you could have each block work with multiple data points. And then you could loop through those data points in this process. Naively, that could, that could be something that might work. Um, you could allocate threat. Each, so each block would then be responsible for multiple data points instead of just one. And you could do this similar, this same process. It won't be as fast, but it would still work. I mean, you could use some threads in, in that block to be responsible for, um, I don't know. Let's say you have, let's say you have too many, too many data points and you have, you know, let's say 60,000 blocks, uh, 100 to 20,000 data points. So you would choose, two data points per block, right? You could assign half the threads in the block to be responsible for the first data point, half the threads to be responsible for the second. Um, that is if the cluster sizes are, are small enough, um, which, they, which they usually are. So you could just kind of subdivide your threads that way within each block, and that would still work. Anything else?
So my point is that if there are, if there are not many um, uh, aspects, um, so by, by doing the signalization, you can actually give them uh, many opportunities. So you're asking, are you asking if synchronization interferes with performance? I, uh, it, it will um, if, well, Synchroniz so synchronization happens within each block, and it's and it's so it happens within each data point. I I don't think that there will be a problem there, because synchronization. Are you talking about threads? You know, waiting for each other. Oh no no no! All you need to do is either is either um, explicitly call. A function that's called sync threads. I think one of the examples in the in the pairwise sum from last time had a call to sync threads, and that just automatically synchronizes threads in each block. You don't have to micromanage each thread when you synchronize. Is that sort of what you're asking? Um, or well, I I kind of in my implementation of k-means, honestly, I completely avoid this synchronization issue by just letting these first two bullets be. Um, be one kernel, and then my my other kernel is the the step that happens after the synchronization. You'll you'll see you'll see in a bit. But I, I compute all these distances, and then I make sure I'm done computing the distances, and then I do something else. Did I, did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, I, I will get to the code. I promise you that. So we synchronize threads. If, if this is all one kernel, we synchronize these threads to make sure that we're done computing all these distances before we move on. Because what we do next is let uh, we take one thread particular to the nth data point and assign data point n to its nearest cluster center. And that involves looping over the distances, finding the minimum, and then assigning the data point n to that corresponding cluster. And in order to do that, we need all the distances. And to make sure we, need, we have all the distances, we need to synchronize threads somehow. We need to either synchronize threads or spawn a new kernel. I chose in my implementation to spawn a new kernel, as we'll see. OK, so that's step two, computing the distances and reassigning the points. Now we need to recompute the cluster centers, because at this point, at the end of step two, Right before step three, the cluster centers are no longer the means of the data points within those centers, within those clusters, because we've done a reassignment. So step three is recomputing cluster centers. And here's how you parallelize it, or you can. I mean, there are multiple ways to it to do it. This is this is in a very simple case how I did. So we spawn one block for each cluster center. So within each block, compute the mean of the data in the corresponding cluster, and you move that cluster center to be that mean that you just calculated. So each in step three, you're working on these k clusters, right? And so, and you're working on them you know, independently so you can do them in parallel very easily. Within each block, you're, you're sort of reassigning uh, cluster mean k to its new value using block number k. And the threads in the block compute the mean of the data within that cluster. Make sense? Some slowdown. Yes. That's true. So if there are a lot of points in one cluster, and there are not so many points in other clusters, then you are going to have a slowdown at the very beginning. So if you're doing this kind of parallelism, I recommend choosing initial values such that your cluster sizes are about equal. I mean, that's, that's how I would go about it. I'm sure there are other ways to parallelize this that completely avoid that, that problem of unequal cluster sizes. But this is, I mean, I intended this to be very to be very simple and to be very pedagogically friendly. There are much much better k-means algorithms than the one I'm presenting, but 
This is this is presented just to get people's foot in the door and to under understand how you how you could you know get started with with things. All right, let's jump right into the code. So I'm going to go through the whole source file from beginning to end, and here's the beginning. So first, you know, basic headers. This function, this macro i, is a macro that I use for indexing arrays. Now, I maintain a matrix of distances throughout this program. And yeah, this I know this, this font is kind of small. Um, if it got any bigger, then things would look really clumsy. So unfortunately, I had to use this small font. But if you guys want to move up closer, we're not very many. So you should be able to, to see better if you do that. So the reason I have this macro i is because it's really difficult to work with two-dimensional arrays on the GPU in CUDA C. There are ways to do that, to work with two- and three-dimensional arrays, but you sort of have to go back to the graphics language paradigm, which is really annoying and cumbersome. And it's just best if you work with one-dimensional arrays. Now, sometimes you'll want to work with, so with objects that have the look and feel of two-dimensional arrays, which is why I wrote this function to sort of index a one-dimensional array as if it were a 2D array. So I, I take you know, i with you know, the row I want, the column I want. So I have a, mat I have a matrix you know, A with entries A, I, J. Then row would be I, column would be J. Uh, and I have the number of columns here. And if you want to index it in row, ma in, if I index matrix in row major order, then, then to return you know, the ij element of the array, the row call element of the array, I would just take the element of that one dimensional array with index row times n columns plus call. And that would just give me the corresponding index of the linear array. So that when I use this function as you know, an indexing function, I can, I can just input the row I want, the column I want, and this function finds where, where my element should be in that 1D array. This lines 6 through 9, these next lines, have the error checking that I talked about. Remember, I, I, last time, I went on and on and on about error checking and how important it was, but I didn't actually show you any error checking. Well, now I'm breaking my own hypocrisy, and I'm showing you some error checking. So there is this macro called CUDA call. I'm using. There, there are several, by the way, there are several error checking mechanisms like this in other textbooks and things you find online. I'm borrowing from Zeb because he wrote this really nicely. Um, you didn't write it, Zeb? OK. So it is from the NVIDIA examples. I must have not looked very hard, because I didn't find the same thing. But uh, I, any, in any case, I borrowed it from you, and I modified it a little bit. But let's see. So it's called CUDA call. X is a function that could either be CUDA malloc or CUDA memcopy or CUDA free or some other built-in CUDA C function that has a return type of an error status. So CUDA malloc, CUDA memcopy, and CUDA free return error status messages as the return types. And it's really important to check what those values are to diagnose problems. So we just take x as that return value of that function. And I'm checking whether it equals CUDA success. CUDA success is a built-in macro that says, you know, this is the value that these functions return when they return successfully. Um, and if x is not equal CUDA success, something's wrong. And so the next few lines tell you what's wrong. So we print CUDA error at um, inside whatever file we're in, and it prints the line number. And it also calls this function, this really neat function called CUDA get error string, which takes a return status number and, well, and actually explains to you what's going on. It might tell you, you know, out of memory, or sometimes there's a race condition, sometimes, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that you never would have found otherwise. So 
Um, and CUDA get last error just tells you, just, just extracts what your last error is. Pretty simple. In the documentation, you had return exit failure instead of exit exit failure. If you return exit failure, this might not work because it might, this call, the CUDA call, might be embedded in some other function and you might return exit failure, but exit from the function and the program is still running. And that's bad because it could run to run to segmentation fault or other kinds of failure. And uh, you know, if there's a memory leak, there's trouble. So you want to you want to exit exit failure, not return exit failure. Um, moving on. So step two of k-means is to remind you that is when we recompute distances between each point and their cluster center and reassign the clusters. So get dist is a kernel, remember double underscore, uh, double underscore global, it means that this function is a kernel. This is a kernel that computes the distance between each point and its cluster center. So, and here's, here's what I'm doing here. I'm taking in a float vector of float array of distances. Now this is a linear array, but I'm gonna use it as a two-dimensional array. So each column is a point and each row is a cluster. That's how I'm visualizing this you know, 2D array, but I'm only using it as a 2D array. In memory, it's actually stored as a linear array. I have an array of length capital N denoting the X coordinates of each point in my data. Same thing for all the Y coordinates. Now mu X and mu Y are the X coordinates and the Y coordinates of the cluster means. So these are arrays of length capital K. Now, I let index I, remember each, remember in this one, I'm computing the distances, each block corresponds to a data point and each uh, thread within in the block corresponds to a cluster. So if I is the block index and J is the thread index within that block, then I corresponds to a point and J corresponds to a cluster. And when I call this, I'm gonna call it with N threads and uh, K, so sorry, N blocks and K threads per block. So I'm gonna run this a bunch of times simultaneously and for each, in each iteration, each, each simultaneous call gets a block index, a thread index, that corresponds to a data point and a cluster, respectively. So what I'm doing is I'm just computing the distance, this distance between point I and cluster J. So you can imagine this distance as, you know, uh, this distance I of IJ block dim dot X to be the two-dimensional array entry at row I column J. Since I'm using this indexing function, I can think of it that way, even though distance is actually a one-dimensional array. By the way, block dim is just the number of threads per block. And that's the number of clusters. So it's the number of columns, which means I'm correctly referencing you know, what I think of as a two-dimensional array you know, in, in row major order. You want to use column major order to define your indexing function, and where you, when you're using your indexing function, where you're using things like um, BLAS and KULA, because those are based on, blah, uh, sorry, KUBLAS and KULA, because KUBLAS and KULA are based on LAPAC and BLAS, and those are written natively in Fortran, which use column major order indexing. So, um, but I'm using row major order here because I like it better, and I'm, I, so I'm and I'm free to do that because I'm not using either of those libraries. But anyway, so this distance is just gonna be simply, well, square distance in the x direction from the point i from cluster center j plus the y squared distance. Make sense? Now, remember all these you know, I said when I was explaining this that after this I would want to synchronize threads. I want to, I, if, if this, if all of step two were in all one kernel, I would want an explicit call to sync threads, the function sync threads. But 
I don't really need to do that here because what I can also do is, you know, to make sure I have all the distances computing before, computed before I use them, I can just simply break up step two into two different kernels. And that's what I did. So this one computes the distances. Kernel two finds the cluster that's nearest to my current point and reassigns that point to that nearest cluster. So I'm going to call this with one block, with, with sorry, with n, capital N blocks, one block for each data, data point. And so I is my data point, and there's one thread per block. And I'm going to loop over J, which is the cluster index. And I'm going to loop over some, I'm going to keep track of some min distance. And I'm just going to loop over all the clusters. I'm going to find the min distance and assign the group of the ith data point, the data point that we're currently on, to the corresponding cluster center. Now I use j plus 1 because I, I want my cluster indices to go from 1 to capital K instead of from 0 to capital K minus 1, just for convenience. That's why I have that j plus 1 here. Make sense? All right, moving on. So step three, recomputing the cluster mean. So once I've reassigned the points, I do that also in two kernels. What I do is I take the mean of the points within each cluster in the y direction and the mean of each points of, of all the points within each cluster also in the x direction. So what I'm doing, my first kernel, what I do is actually I split this up into three kernels. And the next one is on the, the next page. But what I do here is I just I keep track of the sums of the cluster of the points in each cluster and the number of points in each cluster. I, I only needed, you know, I don't need nx and ny, uh, two copies of the same thing. Nx and ny are just the number of points in each cluster center. They're not different in the x direction and the y direction, but I just have two copies of them anyway. I don't I this could have these could have I didn't really need ny. Um, but I need to keep track of the number of points in each, in each cluster so I can average all the points in the x direction and the y direction. So once I've cleared these, I call another kernel. And that kernel has capital K threads. And each cluster gets one of these threads. And I loop over all the data points. And I say, well, If the group of i is j plus 1, I'm going to add the x value and the y value of that point to the running sum, and then increment the number of points in that cluster. So I'm just taking the sum in the x direction and the y direction of all the points in each cluster. And I'm, keeping, I'm counting how many there are. So are those used on CPU and stuff like that? This is actually going to happen on the GPU. So this, this happens in parallel across clusters. And this also happens in parallel across clusters. I can't do this in parallel across points as easily because I'm, well, I could, I could parallelize this across points, but it would not be embarrassingly parallel like I have it here. It'd be, it'd be a little trickier because I'm keeping a running sum, these running sums particular to each cluster. And I have to be careful about having um, writing, you know, having having two threads write to the same location. And that's that's why I use loops instead of different threads. But you could probably come up with a parallel scheme that that does this, uh, has some level of parallelism across points. All right. And in recenter step two, recenter step two, which is really the continuation of step three. Um, I have these sums in the x direction, the sums in the y direction. I just divide them by the total number of points in each cluster. And I get the cluster means in the x direction and the y direction. And I do this, I parallelize across clusters when I do that, because I can work with the clusters independently. And then my regular k means function, once I have all that, I can just call these kernels successively. So, so I, this is my main, this is my k means function the thing that puts all these kernels together. And I loop over i, which is the index. In this case, it's the index 
the, of the current iteration. Um, in my implementation, I don't ch actually check for convergence. I just take an input of you know, number of iterations that you want. For each iteration, I'm going to compute the distances. I'm going to reassign points to clusters. I'm going to, so that's step one. Step two, assigning points. And here's step three, re -cluster, uh, reassigning cluster means. And I'm going to do that is I'm going to clear the cumulative sums and totals for each cluster. And then I'm going to call recenter step one, recenter step two to recompute those cluster means. That is most of the work for my program. All I have to do is set up and clean up now. By the way, I have these functions read data and print results. I'm not going to go through them, but they're exactly what you think they are. And here's my main function. So I have to define all of these things on the CPU side, or actually most of these things on the CPU side. So I have to define you know, number, of number of points, number of clusters, they're in lowercase, um, x and y, data in the x and y direction, mu x mu y, me cluster means in the, in the x and y direction. Um, I define the same things on the GPU, except there is an additional distance and there are additional within cluster sums that I have to worry about, and a uh, within cluster count, count of the number of points within each cluster. I have to worry about that additionally on the GPU. I once I define those things, I read my data in. I'm reading x and y, my my x and y coordinates for the um, for the data. I also read in mu x and mu y because I assume I've already computed some uh, some set of initial values outside the program and stored them in mu x and mu y. Um, I allocate group on CPU side. And now there are all these CUDA malloc calls to allocate memory for all these objects, the group, the data, the cluster means, the, cumulative, the within cluster sums, within cluster total, um, the distance array. I allocate all of those using CUDA malloc, like I talked about last time, and I wrap it in this CUDA call, which is our error checking thing. With CUDA malloc? Um, that's the only way, as far as I know, to create global memory. Because if you do it within kernels, you're going to have local memory. If you, any, any memory that you create inside a kernel is going to be in local memory, particular to that thread, and it's going to be um, and it's going to be freed when you when you exit the kernel. It's you could there is a way to allocate memory inside kernels. There is some sort of malloc within kernels, and that's very that's a very recent development um, from Nvidia, but it's still strongly discouraged. Uh, it's very much encouraged to allocate all the memory you will ever need from the CPU using CUDA malloc. People are trying, NVIDIA is trying more and more and more to, to make, to try to make um, GPU computing like computing in regular C, but it's not quite there yet. Anything else? All right. So I've got some more CUDA mem copies for the data and for the within cluster means. Now, now I call K means. And it's just one line. And k-means takes care of all those kernel calls. And it fills my data with what I want. What I want to return from this using CUDA mem copies are the, oh, actually, these are CUDA mem copies, actually. I've got to copy the data and within cluster means to the device. Then I call k-means. And what I want back is group, which is a vector keeping track of what, what cluster each point belongs to. So that's a vector of length capital N. And my within cluster, my cluster centers. I copy those back, and I wrap those in CUDA calls. That's my error checking. And I print the results. By the way, don't forget to free everything. You call free on your CPU objects and CUDA free on everything else. And every time I use CUDA free, I need to wrap it in a CUDA call. 
All right, now to actually run this thing. You can download this code, it's up online. I just type in make and makes this, the first line makes the CPU version. Next line calls NBCC to make the GPU version. There's a .cu file as the source for the GPU version. Um, notice I had these flags in the, in the CPU version, wall, ANSI, and pedantic. Those are really good standard practice for, for C programs. Wall means all warnings. ANSI just states the version of C that I want to use. That's ANSI C. That's what I happen to use. And pedantic just tells you, just makes the warnings more verbose and, and maybe even gives you extra warnings. Um, it's very good to have. And to include those same flags in NBCC when you're compiling, for each argument, you need this dash dash compiler options flag right before it, right before every one of these additional flags. And I don't think there was a pedantic option, but there were ANSI and wall options, which are sufficient for most, for, for a lot of things. One thing, always run your programs through CUDA memcheck. And this is how you do it. You just type in CUDA dash memcheck and then run your program. You can have any number of arguments after, your, after the call to your main binary. And as you can see, zero errors. That's what you want. Sometimes you'll have memory leaks for GPU objects. It will show you. Sometimes you'll have race conditions where two different threads try to write to the same piece of memory uh, at the same time, which is really bad. Sometimes they go undiagnosed, but in my experience, CUDA memcheck catches at least some of those race conditions which is really helpful. Also diagnoses illegal memory references, um, maybe use of uninitialized values, all that good stuff it checks for. And those are hidden errors, very hard to diagnose in practice. CUDA memcheck makes it all easier. Now, there's this other thing, Valgrind, which is the same thing, but for straight up C, pure C. I recommend also checking your CUDA C programs in Valgrind. And how you do it is you just type in Valgrind if Valgrind is installed, and then run your binary. Again, it takes any number of arguments. It's more verbose, as you can see, than, than CUDA memcheck. And it'll tell you these warnings, set as address range, perms, large range, no access. That's just because you wrote to, you wrote to the uh, GPU, you, you allocated memory on the GPU and it doesn't know what you're doing. It's not supposed to know what you're doing, so you can ignore that. What's important is down at the bottom. Error summary, zero errors from zero contexts. That's the magic message that you want. It tells you those sorts of errors that it look for, looks for are okay. If you have serious memory leaks, there would be errors. If you have use of uninitialized values, use, uh, then use of uninitialized variables, then you would have errors here. You want to look at the leak summary as well. It says definitely lost six bytes in one block. That's because Valgrind thinks you have a memory leak. Usually this is very, very important and you'll want to go and see where it is. And you'll want to rerun like it says with leak, leak check equals full to see the details so you can diagnose it. But in this case it doesn't matter because I pretty much know that what it thinks is a memory leak is actually use of memory on the GPU. So using the GPU kind of messes with the information that, that um, k-means gives you, and so you can ignore that bit. It's usually 16 one bytes in one block in my experience. Um, so if it's any more than that, you'll want to look for, for trouble. And then you run it for real. And so just to tell you graphically what was going on, I ran it on a test data set and this test data set is online, and here's how, how the points, I've clustered the points initially. I tried to choose challenging starting conditions so that some things, things that actually change over the course of the algorithm. These aren't very many points, just a few hundred, I think. And here is my final clustering. It's kind of hard to tell visually if that's the right clustering. Um, I just looking at these points, I would think that one cluster would be sufficient. The data aren't actually divided naturally into clusters. If you look, if you look here, there's really nothing visually distinguishing. Um, but right. 
Right. Yeah, that's a hard problem. What it means to be cluster is a hard problem. Um, I'm working on a clustering project with Dr. Moitro, uh, whose, whose office is just down the hall here. And he, what our next problem, one of our next problems is defining what we mean by a cluster and sort of choosing the number of, which what I mean by that for this case is choosing the number of clusters. You don't automatically always know that three clusters is the right number. You have to, you have to do that rigorously and it's very difficult to do. I just did this just for the sake of having an example. All right, we've got 10 minutes, but I'll get as far as I can on the MCMC. So this was an example from STAT 544, which is Bayesian statistics from last spring. Dr. Jared Nimi taught it, and Zeb and I were in that class together. Um, so we took a bladder cancer data set, and it's available from cancer.gov, and it's a data set on the rates of death from bladder cancer in white males in the US from 2000 to 2004 within each county in, in the US. So what we have in our data are these Y sub Ks, the number of observed deaths in county K, and N sub K, the number of person years that we observe these people divided by 100,000. Now, to, so this is our data right here. This is our data, and to put a model to it, we assume that we have, we're talking about some expected numbers of deaths per 100,000 person years. That's theta k. And we define the model. So the death rate has, death rates have Poisson distribution. And the expected values of those death rates, we assume, are from some constant, or, or from some gamma prior that's shared by all the counties. Remember, K stands for county. County is not spelled with a K, but it's indexed by one in this example. Our shape parameter, is, has, a hyper, our shape parameter has a hyper prior. It's uniform. And so does our rate parameter. Beta here is not the scale. It's the rate parameter in the gamma distribution. So the expectation of this gamma is alpha over beta, not alpha times beta. So we assume also that the shape and rate are independent, and we fix these upper bounds in the uniform distribution. OK, so the goal is to sample from this model. We want to sample from this joint posterior distribution. And we're going to use Gibbs, uh, metropolis sampling within Gibbs sampling to, to accomplish this. Um, we're going to apply Bayes' rule to express the joint distribution as a likelihood times the prior. And we factor out this prior using the definition of conditional probability. And since alpha and beta are independent, I get this factorization. And since all the counties, I'm assuming independence over across, across all the counties, I can express this likelihood times this theta prior in terms of this product over k. And now I plug in the def the, what, these, what this likelihood and this prior for theta k actually are. So, so this is a Poisson distribution. This is a gamma distribution. And these are each uniform, so they're just indicator variables. And we iteratively sample from the full conditional distributions. We want to extract what the full conditional distributions are of each parameter based on what I know here about the joint distribution up to a proportionality constant. And, get, and by Gibbs sampling, or through Gibbs sampling, I want to iteratively sample from them, from these conditionals. So I'm going to take alpha from eval alpha given everything else. I'm going to take beta from its full conditional. And I'm going to take each theta k from its full conditional, which depends on y, depends on all the other k, all the other thetas, alpha and beta. But these theta k's are independent. And so I can sample all these theta k's, all these 3,000 and change thetas in parallel, all at the same time. And that's, that's the key. And that's, that's why you can do, you can, parallelize, you can parallelize this with CUDA C. So here are the full conditionals. So um, for theta k, 
the full conditional for theta k is proportional to the joint distribution considering all the other thetas are constant and alpha is constant and beta is constant. So you can, if you consider the joint distribution just as a function of theta k, then, then this conditional distribution is proportional to the joint here. And if you take all of those proportionality constants out that depend on other parameters, what you get are things left that only depend on theta k. This is the kernel of the distribution. I simplify that down, and you, may, you might say, well, that looks like the kernel of the gamma distribution, and you would be right. This is proportional to this gamma distribution, which is, in fact, the full conditional of theta k. So in my parallel step in this algorithm, I'm going to have a bunch of draws, a bunch of parallel draws from this gamma distribution, which is different for each county, by the way, because the death rate's going to be different, number of person years is going to be different. We're going to have a gamma distribution for each county, but we're going to sample from those gammas all at the same time. For alpha and beta, here's what we do. So we do the same thing. Conditional is proportional to joint if we let some things be constant. And here's what we get. We can simplify it a little bit, but it's not in any nice recognizable form. We get same, a similar thing for beta, but this time it's a little bit nicer because I can simplify this down to a truncated gamma distribution. And in his implementation, Zeb just took B naught to be infinity, so we could work with an actual gamma distribution instead of a truncated gamma. It made sense for the data to do that. For some, for some data sets, it won't make sense. We just have to look at the data and see, uh, can we make this B naught be really large? And if we can, it's advantageous because it's much easier to sample from regular gamma than it is a truncated gamma. And for this example, we had to write, well, Zeb had to write all the, most of the samplers himself. And we only really get uniform distributions for free. Um, well, and, you know, and, and a Poisson distribution and a normal distribution on the GPU, but that's really it. NVIDIA doesn't give us a gamma sampler. Um, so we have to write one. So I don't have time, actually, to go over this. Um, I apologize. I know this was a coding day, not, not a straight algorithms day. Um, I will go over the code next time. I'll find the time to finish this talk and move on. But I just want to summarize the Gibbs sampler. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to sample all the theta k's from their full conditional distributions in parallel. So we're going to draw, we're going to draw each theta k from this gamma distribution, and they're all going to happen simultaneously. We're going to sample alpha from its full conditional using a random walk metropolis step. Now, alpha, we use random walk metropolis because alpha doesn't have a nice distributional form. So it would be really difficult to sample from. Um, we could use rejection sampling, straight out rejection sampling, but we would have to choose a nice proposal, and that might be a little bit difficult. Random walk metropolis is a very good choice. And we sample beta from its full conditional distribution, which is actually a truncated gamma. We could use the inverse CDF method if beta naught is low, or use a non-truncated gamma distribution if, if, if B naught is high. And the current implementation assumes that B naught is, is high. And the gamma sampler, I have a gamma sampler in the notes that Zeb used. It's very, it's very good. I used it for my for other MCMCs that I've done. It's it has at least a 95% acceptance rate with the shape parameter when the shape parameter is greater than or equal to one, which is going to be true for a lot of applications. So this is a very good gamma sampler. If you have shape parameters less than one, you're going to be you're going to need to use different gamma samplers though. And I explain random walk metropolis. I'm going to get to that next time. I didn't. I'm going to get to the code next time. I know I'm over time, but I just want to remind you 
where these materials are. All right. So first of all, I got these things from Dr. Moitro's Stat 580 notes. That's where I learned about k-means. I got this MCMC from Dr. Nimi's 544 notes. There's a link to his materials in the slide for that in that old from from this from his course. And then Gelman's book is on Bayesian data analysis. I use that one. And then Marsegli and Sang wrote the gamma sampler that I used. K-means and MCMC, those programs are available for download as zip files. And everything in the series is available on the GPU course homepage. Thank you for coming. And I'm sorry you didn't get to everything, but I will try to make up for that next time. Mm -hmm.